My name is James Watson. I'm a consultant in the departments of neurology and anesthesiology uh, pain division. Thank you for your interest in our article on peripheral neuropathy, a practical approach to diagnosis and symptom management. I wrote this with my colleague, Dr. James Dick, uh, of the Department of Neurology and our peripheral nerve uh, division. As you know, regardless of your background or specialty, peripheral neuropathy is a common disorder that's seen in about 2.5% of all people and increases as people get older. About 8% of those greater than 55 years of age have evidence of peripheral neuropathy. Referral for evaluation of sensory disturbance, including peripheral neuropathy, is one of the top five reasons that patients are referred to see us in neurology. As you know, there are certain disorders in which peripheral neuropathy is even more prevalent. Patients with diabetes, people with dysproteinemias, people who have re are receiving chemotherapy are more likely to have a peripheral neuropathy. In diabetics, for example, up to one-third to two-thirds of patients will develop evidence of a peripheral neuropathy, though many of those patients will remain asymptomatic, um, and that diagnosis is based off of clinical or electrophysiologic criteria. At the same time, those patients still remain at risk for uh, damage or ulcerations uh, from insensate feet, and so it's important to recognize if someone has an underlying neuropathy if they have one of these disorders in which peripheral neuropathy is prevalent. As we structured this as a practical approach, we looked at three primary, uh, three pr primary scenarios. The first being, how do you effectively and efficiently screen in less than two minutes a patient who's presenting you for their routine follow-up of one of these systemic processes in which peripheral neuropathy is prevalent, but where the patient is likely asymptomatic and you're simply trying to screen for the evidence of the neuropathy in a routine follow-up visit. The second part is how do we then identify patients who present with signs or symptoms that suggest to us that they may have a neuropathy, what testing is appropriate for them or high yield in defining the cause of their neuropathy. And the third scenario being how do we help treat the symptoms of patients for which we've done all that we can do to treat the cause of the neuropathy but who are still left with painful neuropathy. The first scenario is how do we efficiently and effectively screen asymptomatic patients this has been studied um, previously, uh, and what we know is that history is insufficient to make the diagnosis in, the, in these cases. As many patients with evidence of a neuropathy and at risk for injury to insensate feet can still have clinical evidence of a neuropathy that it's important to recognize. Single modality testing is not as useful as multimodal testing, and a screening that combines both vibration testing as well as light touch testing the combination of that shows the highest degree of combination sensitivity and specificity for making the or recognizing in a screening that someone has an evidence of a peripheral neuropathy. This is more effective than single mo modality testing or simply looking at ankle reflexes or pinprick sensation. Our next scenario is how do we then take someone who has evidence of a peripheral neuropathy or presents with signs or symptoms suggesting us to us that they may have a peripheral neuropathy in the manuscript, we define ways to clinically define the clinical pattern of involvement and to use that to define which patients may benefit from visiting with a neurologist and which patients may be able to be evaluated without requiring a subspecialty consultation. Most peripheral neuropathies are mild, sensory predominant, length dependent, symmetric peripheral neuropathies, the old stocking glove peripheral neuropathies. These can often be evaluated without requiring specialty consultation if they are mild and sensory predominant. The highest yield test in evaluating these patients include screening for diabetes, either a fasting glucose and or hemoglobin A1C. The next most useful screening test is a screen to look to see if a patient has a monoclonal protein, a dysproteinemic process. When we see patients referred to us who have had testing for this, they routinely have had SPEP uh, serologic tests performed. But we know that SPEP misses about 20% of uh, monoclonal proteins, and it misses almost one-third of IgM monoclonal proteins. And IgM monoclonal proteins tend to be the ones that are most commonly associated with a peripheral neuropathy. By assessing the serum protein immunofixation study, we can identify the cause of peripheral neuropathy in about 10% of those who present with a peripheral neuropathy. The next most useful screen is that of testing for B12 deficiency. Serum B12 levels are usually not identified to be absolutely low, though sometimes they can. This is seen in about 2% of patients who present with peripheral neuropathy. But we know that patients with low normal levels of B12 can be cellular deficient for the amount of B12 that they need um, for normal neurologic function. We can pick these patients up by checking methylmalonic acid in those patients who have a low normal B12 level. And when you add methylmalonic acid testing to your routine B12 screen, you increase the yield of identifying the cause of the neuropathy from about 2% 
up to about 8%. Other tests that are commonly used, such as thyroid testing, aren't very common causes of neuropathy, but they are prevalent in, in treatable disorders, and that's why they're routinely screened in patients who present with peripheral neuropathy. The final important thing to screen in all patients who present with peripheral neuropathy is that of a family history. Hereditary neuropathies are probably the most common and overlooked cause of idiopathic peripheral neuropathies. Patients who have a hereditary neuropathy often are unaware that someone else in the family has signs or symptoms of a neuropathy. And if you identify a neuropathy, it's important for them to talk with family members to see if there is any family history. Our final scenario is how do we treat patients symptomatically? The first and foremost is to identify the cause of that neuropathy and then treat that directly if possible. And while that is often effective in preventing further progression or slowing the progression of the neuropathy, it often is insufficient to resolve this, the painful symptoms associated with the neuropathy. In those scenarios, we're left with treating those uh, patients symptomatically. Oftentimes when we use medications, we have to use medications of different mechanisms of action in combination with each other to maximize the benefit as far as pain control. First line agents include the gabapentinoids like gabapentin with goal dosing between 1800 to 3600 milligrams per day, pregabalin with goal dosing of 300 to 600 milligrams per day, tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline or nortriptyline with goal dosing close to 100 milligrams per day, and duloxetine with goal dosing of 60 milligrams per day. We often will use one of the serotonergic norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors such as a TCA or duloxetine in combination with one of the gabapentinoid agents uh, to maximize control for patients. We hope you enjoyed our article on a practical approach to the diagnosis and symptom management of peripheral neuropathy. Thank you for your time. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.